But one thing that hasn't shut down, one thing that hasn't quit is sin, unrighteousness, and the human traffickers. They haven't shut down. Yes. They have not stopped. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's gotten worse in, uh, throughout this year because uh, our organization, which you guys support, let me just stop there and say thank you for what you have done for the past few years and how you send the monthly contribution to help the kids in, uh, in Thailand. And I've got a great deal to say about that this morning, but I do want to start by saying thank you for what you do. Uh, sending the, the contribution, and I know that where, where you send money, prayers are, are sure to follow. And so thank you for that. We are an anti-trafficking organization. And in, uh, in past years, trafficking, and, and we're going to talk about what that is and what it looks like in just a few minutes, but trafficking in past years has, uh, has uh, much of it's been done on the street, it's been done in, in various ways, face to face, but in these days of lockdown, in these days of COVID, so much has went online. And so I start with that today to say those of you who have children and uh, grandchildren, uh, keep tabs on where they're going online. Keep up with who they're talking to because all is not as it seems online. That's where a lot of this is going on now. And I'll have more to say about that in just a little while. But uh, the organization is called Grace. That's the acrostic for, and it's, it's long, it's a big name, Global Relief Association for Crisis and Emergencies. Everybody just knows this as Grace, G-R-A-C-E. And uh, that's, uh, that's who we are. And as we start, as we start to think about this, I want to direct our attention to Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew chapter number 25, because this is really right at the heart of who we are, uh, our orientation as an organization, as a ministry, and you guys are a part of this. You guys are partners in anti-trafficking. And, uh, and that's, that's so, so vitally important because it takes all of us working against this evil in the world. We, we need more churches. We need more churches to come together and, and be aware of this and understand what's going on in the world. I've always said from the very beginning since I began learning about this and understanding a little bit of what's going on in the world that our greatest defense against this wickedness is strong churches and communities. That's what we need. And so I want to read to you Matthew chapter number 25. Just going to start down in verse number 31. Matthew chapter number 25 in verse number 31. I do apologize for not... Uh, uh, I wish I had a, a projector I could bring and show pictures because we got pictures of the kids and, and things like that. If you've got a smartphone with you, you can, uh, you can go on our website at globalreliefassociation.com. You can go to our, our Facebook site and you can see all of these pictures of these kids that you guys help to support. But Matthew 25, 31, Scripture says, this is Jesus talking, of course. He says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. That, that's, that's amazing just to think about that, isn't it? Yeah. All nations will be gathered together before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the, the sheep on the right hand, goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, bless them, my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say also to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is really at the very core of who we are. And this is, this has, uh, through the years, uh, our organization is eight years old. Uh, last month, eight years we've been doing this. And this has been so much at the core of who we are. This is, uh, I like to, I think of this as really Christianity in practice. It's, a, it's going to meet the needs wherever the Lord shows you or calls you or draws you into to serve other people. There are people all over this area, all over the U.S., all over the world, all over Thailand that fit this. And when the Lord shows these things to us, that's His invitation for us to join Him in what He's already doing in that, that person's life, in that group of people's life. He's always at work. God never sleeps and He never slumbers. He never takes a vacation. He never goes down to Panama City and takes a week off. He never does any of that. He's always at work in His redemptive plan. So that's who we are. That's a, that in the beginning, with that, that's a little bit of, of what we're about. Now, with this thing in how what He has called us into is this world of uh, anti-trafficking. We know today... if. And I go to churches all the time and, and share with them what we're doing, what we're up to, what the Lord has led us into. And I find so many really don't know about this world of human trafficking and how prevalent it is. Used to, before I began learning about it, I thought, maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe that's something that only happens in places like Eastern Europe or in Asia. Certainly not here in the U.S. of A. Not here. We're the we're the pearl of the world. Nothing so terrible would happen like that here. However, we find out it does very, very much so. Yes. It's known as modern day slavery. And just uh, just want to share just a little bit about that. We're not going to jump into a bunch of statistics and and those types of things. But just knowing the prevalence of this thing and that virtually every country in the world deals with it on some level. That's staggering to think that, that people actually buy and sell human beings for, uh, for labor, for sex, for a multitude of reasons. But it's known as modern day slavery and it's always marked by, it, it's a, it's a, it always uses force, fraud, coercion, something like that, to, to oftentimes to trick a person into this world. And um, it, like I said, it's always for some type, of, some type of labor. And so it's so prevalent. It's, uh, even in our time in, in Thailand, we, we lived there for um, uh, three, and a half, three and a half years, almost four years before uh, we, we come home to, de to develop some things here. But... But while we're there, so many different things we saw from, can you imagine someone selling their child? Could you, could we, well, us sitting here in this room, we cannot, con probably cannot conceive of that. Even selling an unborn child, 
promising it to someone else. We had that happen within our circle of people that we knew. We, we, were, uh, we became acquainted with forced prostitution. Uh, all these types of things. Uh, in, in Thailand, there's a, there's a big fishing and shrimping industry and uh, these companies get their labor from slaves. People who are promised one thing, but it never comes to pass, and they literally spend their life on a shrimping boat out of the Gulf of Thailand. And the, the, we hear these stories and see these things over and over and over. And so, um, this thing of human trafficking, very prevalent. Our mission, our mission as an organization is to uh, foster this change, this social change through strengthening families and eradicating the vulnerabilities of human trafficking and exploitation. And as I talk about this, just remember, you are part of this. You are, you are a partner in this through your giving and through your prayers. But those vulnerabilities that we saw uh, when we were first in Thailand were poverty, illiteracy, and really a lack of the gospel. And I'll say just more about all of those in just a few minutes. But that was a thing that we first began seeing as we, as we arrived in Thailand. And so, um, that's always the question. We grew up, we, uh, Angie and I both, Angie sitting back there, we grew up in Carrollton, Georgia, just down the road from here. And I've been a pastor, missions pastor, and a counselor, I've, all these things. And so, and so people ask, why Thailand? Why? Because Thailand, if, you, if you're familiar with where Thailand is at, and you may have looked that up since you've been acquainted with what we're doing and that kind of thing, it is as far away from Douglasville, Georgia, as you can possibly get and still be on the planet. It's directly that away on the other side. You can't get any further away from, uh, from Ridge Road than, uh, than, than Thailand. It's, uh, it's uh, from door to door when we would travel, when we travel back and forth. It's about 30 hours from the time we leave our house to the time we walk into the house in Thailand. And so that's, that encompasses about anywhere from 21 to 24 hours worth of flying. It just makes me tired to think about that. It's a long way. Generally, it would be a flight from Atlanta to Seoul, South Korea. That's about 15 hours right there. And then there was a flight from Seoul down to Bangkok, which was generally another six hours. So what I'm saying, it's a long way away. People say, why in the world? There's problems right here in, in Douglas County. There, there's problems here in Georgia. Well, why Thailand? I was a missions pastor, and you may be familiar with it, Beulah Baptist Church, just not too awfully far from here. We spent about five years there as their missions pastor, and we had the awesome privilege of, uh, of course, leading missions here locally, nationally, and internationally. So we had the, we had the privilege of, of traveling all over the world, places like Peru, and Russia and Ukraine and what we had projects going on all over the world. Well, it's at one point in time, there's this uh, couple within our church that's called out as mi as missionaries to go to Thailand. So they they uh, through a process they were able to travel and they began their work there. Uh, about a year after they're there, uh, me being the missions pastor, Angie and I got to travel to Thailand to see them and to really see how we could best help them in their work. At that point, I had no intentions of, of uh, moving to Thailand. Uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't even in the framework of anything. And so we, we went there and he was, show, he, he was uh, introducing us to people, showing us the work, was getting more acquainted with what he was doing, seeing how we could help better resource him. In the process of, of uh, just that week or 10 days, every how long we were there, he took us to a daycare, okay? So, you know, leading up to this, like I said, I had the chance to travel all over the world, and I was seeing things that I was not understanding in places like Moscow 
and Lviv, Ukraine, and Lampa, Peru, these types of places, and I was seeing things that I later learned were trafficking. Uh, children begging on the street, uh, prostitution on the street, uh, different, different, uh, different things were happening. So I'm being acquainted with this, and in that process, I'm trying to educate myself on what's going on in the world. So, we're in Thailand. We go to this uh, daycare center. And just to be honest with you, I wasn't really interested in what was going on in the daycare. Okay, we were going to spend our 15, 30 minutes there, play with the kids a few minutes, and move on to the next thing. He was showing us people he'd been acquainted with, who, who he was involved with, and this kind of thing. While we are there, in this uh, daycare, there's, uh, there's children in there anywhere from uh, just uh, a year or two old up until uh, there was a 12, 13 year old in there. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about that. This is a daycare. It's the middle of the school day. What's this 13 year old kid doing in a daycare today? I don't Okay. But while we're sitting there, they want Angie to get up and, and uh, teach some English. There's zero English in there. It's all the Thai language. And uh, we'll, maybe we'll, I'll teach you some Thai in a little bit, okay? And so we're there in this, uh, in this center. Then Angie's up there teaching the ABCs and the one, two, threes. And have you ever had God speak to you that rattled you all the way to your core? It wasn't an audible. It wasn't audible. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't like you speaking to me or me speaking to you. It was the only way I know to describe it. It was louder than that. And this is what the Lord said. This is where trafficking prevention begins. This is where it starts. And it just hit me out of nowhere. And I'm looking around and I see all these little kids, kids in diapers and they're playing and some of them are listening to Angie teach and some of them are in a fight over in the corner and they're hanging all over me and the Lord speaks. And that was one, th that's one thing we know from Scripture that when God spoke, he, uh, the, the person knew that it was Him and they knew what He said. That was it for me there. Sitting there, I knew it was God, and I knew what He said. I didn't know what to do with it at that time, but I knew it was Him. Angie and I, after our little time in the daycare center, we go out and get in the truck, and I look at her, and she looks at me, and God had said the same thing to her, sitting in there. Okay, so we began doing our research. How can we help? Even by the end of that week before we left, we were able to uh, give a donation to that, um, to that daycare, buy them some supplies that were sorely needed. What we found out years later is that that week we were there, the daycare was about ready to close its doors because they lost all their funding. They didn't even know how they were going to feed the kids next week. And so the Lord was really emphatic about this. Give them this money, buy them these supplies, and, and uh, that's where we're going to start. And so that's what happened. And that was in January of 2013. Uh, we actually started this organization in October of 2012. The Lord told us to do it. It was all undefined. But isn't that the way God works sometimes? Isn't that what He does? He, he, this whole thing has been step by step by step. There's been no grand plan of this is what we're going to do and this is where we're going. It's kind of developed a little bit that way now, but it's always been one step at a time. So this is where it started. Sitting in Thailand in January of 2013. In, uh, it was, I remember it was so hot that day. Remember Thailand, right? It's a perpetual summertime. I've always said that there are four seasons in Thailand. Hot, hotter, hottest, rainy season. That's Thailand. And this is January. It was 90, 95 degrees that day in January in Thailand. I still remember that it just kind of burned into my brain. But January, but then by the, by the spring, we actually had a child sponsorship program up and running. We were back in the U.S. I was back at Beulah as missions pastor. Angie was the director of cardiac imaging at Emory Midtown. 
And so this is what we were doing. We come back to that. We come back to raise money to help with some of the things that were going on. We started with this child sponsorship program. 26 children that we had identified as being highly at risk of being exploited, trafficked, something. All these kids were coming out of the slums of, of uh, Patia. That's the city that we were in, Patia, Thailand. It's, it's a tourist town just right outside of Bangkok. This is where it started. That begins to answer why Thailand, because I'm telling you, I would have never said, hey, I want to, uh, I want to move to Padilla, Thailand and live. That's what I want to do. We're all, Padilla, Thailand, you guys are going to love this. It's known as the child sex trafficking capital of the world. That's why the Lord put us there. That's exactly why he put us there in that spot. This, uh, this country is uh, about 96% Buddhist. That means that 1% or less Christian. It is really, really difficult to find a Christian in Thailand. They're there, very few. It's a, it's a country of 67, 68 million, less than 1% Christian. So Buddhism... Buddhism is it. Buddhism is the order of the day. It's all about Buddha and what he taught. And that philosophy permeates everything in society. And in that country, it seems that, that life is very cheap. Especially if you're a little girl. And so that's just the way things are there. And their little... See, we go in because... Yes, we're starting this, anti-trafficking. We're looking at what the Lord wants in all of this. We know it's, it's Buddhist, and, but we're Christian. And so we're going into this with this, with this mindset that, yeah, we're, we're Christian. This, this is Buddhism, less than 1% Christian. And we begin learning about their little, their little slice of Buddhism in that... Okay, you got Buddha, of course, but then their, their particular type of Buddhism is known as Theravada Buddhism. And a lot of what that means is they've adopted all of these Hindi gods into their religion. So they've got, the, they got a God for the trees, and they've got a God for the sky, and the earth, and the wind, and the animals, and they've got, they've got a God for all of this. And so it, early on, the question was, from the Thai people, um, I don't, I don't understand your religion. How, what kind of anemic religion? This is the word. What kind of anemic religion only has one God? Because I don't understand that. Because there's a God for this and that and this and those and them. God for everything. They, they never had that orientation of one true living God. And so you share with them about who Jesus Christ is and what he's done. And they're like, okay, I like that. I like this thing of forgiveness of sin because they know they're bad. So <laughs> they like forgiveness of sin. We like that. We like this idea of heaven, a home in heaven. Okay, so we're going to take the cross and we're going to set it right next to Buddha. We're gonna, he, Jesus is just another God. To them, he's just another guy on the list. And say, no, 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 no. Jesus said of himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And you get that look. It's that, I call it the deer in the headlights look. <laughs> they have no reference to that. Nothing. Never heard that before in their lives. Hmm. Okay. This was, this, was it with, uh, this was the case with some of our staff because as we, um, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, our staff uh, it is totally run in Thailand now by Thai people. That's the way it has to be. That's the only way it's going to continue to, uh, to operate. And so we have a Thai director. Her name is Mai, M-A-I. Remember that name and remember to pray for her, Mai. You can see her picture, like I said, on her Facebook, uh, probably on our website. So her name's Mai. She's a, she was a Christian. She speaks English and Thai. The Lord sent her to us. We cannot do this without her. She is a godsend. 
But then most of the others were Buddhist people. Like I said, it's really hard to find a Thai Christian. So um, the way this the way this kind of developed was that um, we moved there in 2016, and this is all through the Lord leading us down this road. We moved there in 2016 and to set up family resource centers because we recognize that, okay, we remember the vulnerabilities. Poverty, illiteracy, analysis of the gospel. Okay, how do we address that in, in this context, in this culture? Family resource centers. They didn't have a clue to what that was. Family resource center. Okay, because we need an after-school program. We know what an after-school program is. Well, they're everywhere around here, not in Pattaya, Thailand. They don't, that's the foreign concept, after-school program. What does that mean? What, and so we began talking to them. We, we're looking at developing a formal after-school program. That means tutoring, maybe English lessons, Thai lessons, help with homework, activities that promote self-esteem, and the gospel. We got all of this is the idea. This is all of this going into these family resource centers. So after we'd been there for some time, we were able to start our very first family resource center because of uh, spot people who were sponsoring children, churches like Star of Bethlehem, who were sending money to help us do this. And so we were able to open up our very first Family Resource Center. Angie, what month and year was it we opened that Family Resource Center? January 1st, 2017. 2017. We moved there in April of 16. We spent the first few months praying through everything and, um, and networking with people, building relationships with people in the community. And so January 1st, 2017, we opened the doors of First Family Resource Center. So... Uh, we, we identified many more children who are at risk. They're coming. We had arranged it where we could pick them up from school and bring them to the resource center. That was really the only way they were going to get there. So I'm telling you all of this because you're part of this. You're part of this work that goes on still every day in Thailand. So we could pick them up, bring them to the family resource center, pick them up after school, and they come in, they get a healthy snack, and homework assistance. Remember the problem. Poverty, illiteracy. Okay, little, uh, little Richard comes home from, from school and he needs help with homework. He, he's, a little, he's a Thai child in Thailand. He's a Thai child in, in Pattaya. He comes home and he needs some help with his Thai language and he goes to mom and dad. Mom and dad are illiterate. They never went to school. They can't even read their name. And he wants help. He needs help with this. And they said, sorry, Richard. Can't help you. And so his homework doesn't get done. And this kind of perpetuates. And the dropout rate, uh, Angie's got all of these numbers in her. What's the dropout rate before third grade? Dropout rate before third grade is um, 24%. 24%. By seven children never one in seven, yeah. I remember that one. One in seven never go to school in Thailand because just various reasons. One is uh, mom and dad can't afford for the child to go to school. Doesn't that sound weird? They can't afford for Richard to go to school because there's uniforms to buy. This is what we saw early on. You know, it's required that every Thai child has a set of five uniforms, one for each day during the week. There are teacher fees that they have to pay. And if you can't pay the teacher fee, if you can't buy your uniform, this is a tie shirt, by the way. If you can't buy your uniform, guess what? You're not going to school. And so we saw that over and over and over. And what would happen? They'd never go to school. Kids growing up, they can't read their name. Uh, they get to be 12, 13 years old. Mom and dad says, you got to go to work. Where are they going to go to work? What are they going to do? They can't even read their name. They can't, they can't work at uh, a convenience store. They, can, they don't even know their numbers on the cash register. They don't know any of this. And so what happens time and time again, they end up in a, you're going to love this, a brothel. That's what's expected. 
because you do what you have to do to help support mom and dad. And that's just in the Asian culture. And so we were seeing this time and time again. And so we get, we get up to this uh, family resource center. And so we got the child sponsorship program that's helping with scholarships to buy these uniforms, to pay for teacher fees, to do all these things to ensure that these kids can get in school. We help them with homework because nobody else is. And what happened? We saw, we saw retention start to climb. We saw school grades going up. Uh, we, we had kids that when we first got them, they were on the bottom, they were at the bottom of the class, but now they're finishing in the top 10. It was just this major turn, okay? So this is, this is educational stuff going on here. And then we've got all of these, uh, these uh, Thai people who are helping teach math, who are helping teach Thai language, who are doing uh, activities with the kids and carrying them on field trips. These are Buddhist people. However, every Thursday afternoon, every Thursday afternoon at the Resource Center, guess what happens? There's a Bible lesson. There's a movie about Jesus. There's a Sunday school lesson. There's Bible. There, uh, somebody's going to read a, a story from the Bible. Maybe it, it was my uh, in the beginning. And something from Scripture was shared. And guess, guess what we saw happen? One by one, the staff came to know the Lord. These were Buddhist people. This was a miracle of God. And so what, we've got 12 on staff in, uh, of Thai people, 12 people, and today all of them are believers. Every one of them. That if the word of God goes out, it will not return void. It will accomplish that which it was intended to accomplish. And so that's what we've seen just with the staff people, just, just with the people running the center. And now we've got, I don't know how many kids we've got going to, you're going to love this. There's a Baptist church in Pattaya, Thailand. Jom Tien Baptist Church. You can find them on Facebook. Jom Tien Baptist Church. Every Sunday now, they load up the Grace Van and my and her husband, Sean, carry all these kids uh, there's going to be what there's was about twelve. That about 12. Yeah, we, we've got seventy-six kids. Seventy-six kids in the program now. So about twelve of them are going to church every week at the local Baptist church. And so some of them have professed Christ as their Savior, been baptized. This is in a thick Buddhist culture. And oftentimes there is some persecution that goes along with that. I mean, it's not like it is in the Islamic world. But it's more covert in, um, in Thailand. It's more your family won't have anything to do with you. you don't, all of a sudden, you don't get invited over to their house for holidays. And that's the way it kind of works there because you have, uh, the way they term it, you have denied your Thai-ness. Okay? So to be Thai is to be Buddhist. To be Buddhist is to be Thai. If you, if you become Christian, then you're Western. You're more American or European if you're Christian. So we're, we're Thai people, so we're Buddhist. And that's really what they think and how 96% how of them, uh, that they live. And so we started, the, started this family resource center and just seen huge, huge turn in, in educational scores. So we're helping with educational issues uh, nutritional, they, they get healthy food, they get, they get um, food sets every month, staples in their diet. They were not getting this before, but they're getting it now. They're getting, they, they're getting educational support, well, uh, nutritional support, and wellness support. That is, the, uh, we can help when they go to the doctor, buy the, buy the drugs that they need, buy the, buy the medicine that they need. Um, back before we, we left, we were able to get them to the optometrist. None of these, I think maybe one out of all of these kids had ever seen an eye doctor. And they, some of them were complaining they couldn't see the board, they, couldn't, they were like this. We all know about that, don't we? But, you know, they had no expectation of that ever being corrected. Didn't even, some of them didn't even know it could be. And so we, we get them to a local optometrist 
who saw the need and wanted to help us out. And so we connected with him. And so many of our children got, got eyeglasses for the first time. And it was just opened up a whole new world. So we're, we're, we're dealing with, these, uh, with the issues psychologically, physically, and spiritually. The whole person. So that, that's empatia. And then sometime later we were able to open up a second resource center up in the city of Karat. And there's a reason. There's a reason for all of this. How the uh, we've got to like two or three o'clock, don't we? Do we get in there right? <laughs> Karat. Karat is a city up in the Isan region. Okay, Isan is very rural, and we started hearing stories after being there that um, it was it was uh, it was a worse situation up in the Isan region. It borders uh, Laos and Cambodia. Uh, we, we were hearing stories it was worse up there as far as poverty and illiteracy were concerned. We were in the city down here, and so we began exploring that. We, we began to find out that so many of these uh, kids, once again, never go to school, and they get to be a certain age, and um, the pretty ones, the pretty ones go to Patia or Bangkok to get a job in the red light district, and the ugly ones stay at home and work on the farm. And that's, that's the way they term it. That's what they say. And it's horrible the way this all takes place. And so we said, we, the Lord led us into a process of opening the second resource center. We connected with another Baptist church in Thailand. Uh, a uh, pastor up there we connected with. And he, he loved the idea, and he's allowing us to use his church as the resource center in Karat, Thailand. We've got, we've got uh, a vision of seeing these resource centers scattered throughout all of, uh, all of the region. But this is, what, uh, this is really what God is doing. This is what he's been up to all of this time. And it's, just, it's, it's been a, a process of listening to him following Him, trusting Him. Because when He led us, to be honest, when He, he led us into this, we had, we had no intention of doing anything like this. We were fine. We had it made. I was at Beulah, getting to travel all over the world, do all different kinds of things. Angie was, was uh, doing great at Emory Midtown, but the Lord said, no, no, you're going to do this. And it rocked us for a while and honestly we tried to reason our way through it you know we can we can make all the money and just send the money there and send people and go over there from time to time but yet no 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 that was not it God said you need to you are going there and there was a reason for us to go there and I don't have time to tell you everything and all the reasons for being there but God was at work and he continues to be at work uh, right before, uh, we were uh, coming back to the U.S. Like I said, we lived there three and a half, almost four years. We, we lived there, but then, I don't know how much you know about Thailand. They have a constitutional monarchy, which means they have a king. They have a king and a parliament. That king, he's got, he's got a lot more power, really, than Elizabeth does in, uh, in England. Uh, most everything has to go through him to be approved. Parliament can make decisions and do that. He really has to put his stamp on it. So for 70 years they had a king and he was evidently a good king. He was, he was credited with keeping communism out of Thailand. All the countries around them are communistic. They're, they're still a free people. In fact, that's what Thailand means, free land. And so he's credited with that. But... Daddy died. Daddy passed away while we were there. And his son took the throne. His son lived most of his life in Europe. But so he, he uh, when dad died, he come back to be the king. And I always think this is funny. The Thai people, when even when he's about to become king, they're talking to us and telling us about him and his history and this and that. And they still refer to him as a playboy. Okay? He's 68 years old now. <laughs> you go, boy. They still talk to, talk to him like talk about him like he's a playboy because of all the history that he's had. But there's one thing about him. He did not like 
the white people being in his country. We are, he, he said we are losing our tininess. They say that a lot. We're losing our tininess from the influence from the West. And so what I began seeing was one by one visas of Westerners from, from the U.S., Australia, all the European nations, uh, their visas were being denied. They, could, they were having to go back home, so there was no reason for it, but one by one, denied, denied. Ours was coming up. I'm like, oh man, oh boy. But Angie, if she, if she is detailed, if you get to know her, you know she is detailed to the nth degree. She did all the research, knew exactly what we needed. It was still like pulling teeth to get that visa renewed, but she, she gave them absolutely, positively no reason to deny us. And so we got it. And, and when you get your visa, you, ha, you leave your passport at the immigration office uh, for a day. You come back the next day or two days later, whatever it was, you, and the visa's in the passport, you're good for a year. However, we go to pick up the passport with the visa in it, okay? You guys with me? We, we go to pick the passport up with the visa in it, and there's a sign there at the checkout. It says that uh, in 90 days, all visas have to come back for a bank check-in. Bank check-in. We, we had to keep 30000 U.S. dollars in a Thai bank account as a security deposit against our visa. This is, a, this is an unsecured... Thai bank. It's not FDIC, whatever it is, insured. It's not that. You're not going to see that money. $30,000? I could never use that money for programs. I could never use it for the sponsorship program. I could never use it for anything. Every 90 days, every three months, I have to go back to, uh, back to immigration with my passport and my bank statement to show that I never fell below $30,000 U.S. dollars. If I did, Denied, revoked the visa, you're on a plane to the U.S. We saw that happen over and over and over. I'm like, I can't, I can't give them $30,000. I can't do it. And so we, made, that was, we had to make that hard call. But uh, the thing about it is, all these Thai people, they didn't need, all of a sudden, they didn't need us day to day, really. They were running it. They were doing the work. Angie, I give so much credit to Angie, she trained the staff. They bought into her philosophy of running the center. She was, she was so much responsible for them coming to know the Lord. And so it, it's running. We, we, we show up, we help out, we give guidance, we do what we need to do. But they're fine. And so we make that call. We're, we're coming back. The Lord knew what He was doing in all of this, though. We're getting ready. We're coming back. We, there's a big party, there's a big send-off, there's a lot of tears, there's all this. We're going to come back in a, uh, in a few months. We're going to come back and be here for a month and uh, be with you and that kind of thing. Then guess what happened? COVID. COVID happened. And Thailand completely sealed their borders. Like I guess a lot of countries have. But there's no way, no how, us being from the U.S., we, they wouldn't let us out of the airport in, uh, in Bangkok. And so that has been the case. It has been a year and a half now since we've actually, is that right? I lose track of the months and the a years. Over a, year. a little over a year since we were, that's right, since we were physically in Thailand. We get to talk to them. There's this wonderful thing called FaceTime that, we've, that uh, we can talk to them uh, every day if we needed to. It's usually about once a week. We can talk to them. There's Facebook messages, photos that go back and forth. They are doing awesome. They are doing great. They miss us. We miss them. But this is, uh, this is the way it's going, and this is the way it's progressed. And we've got other places in, uh, in Thailand that are asking for us. Please, we... The word gets around how effective, because the Christian community is really, really small there. And so word gets around on what, what's taking place and how effective it is and what's happening with the families and with the kids and, and all of that. And so we've got places uh, that are just calling for us to come 
as soon as we can get funding to go and do that. So the Lord's got a plan through, um, through all of this. But as we come back in, I'll just say this very briefly, then I'll be, I'll be finished. But uh, as we come back in, the Lord really put it on our heart to do something here. Do something in the U.S. Not just Thailand, but here. Because we hear news reports and there's things happening all the time. We've, we've had uh, personal uh, contact with people who've been trafficked here in our little part of the world. And so one of the things we're, we're developing right now is a, and most people don't think about this, but in times of disaster, hurricane, fire, flood, guess what happens? Trafficking goes up. Why is that? The traffickers prey on the vulnerable. Especially you got people, if they're in a low income area, if uh, maybe there's a trailer park, apartment complex, whatever, they're vulnerable anyway, but then they have this happen, and then, and uh, we, ha we, man, we have people that we know about that have volunteered for certain organizations who didn't do a background check, but they can get into, they can go in and pose as a rescue worker, but they're a trafficker. And they can promise things to these people who have been left homeless, who don't have a job, who were really desperate and find out there's not a job at all. And this is the way it happens. So we're, we're actually now uh, have a partnership with, with the state and local authorities to help get us into these disaster areas to identify these people who've been trafficked, potentially trafficked, those types of things. That's just one area. We're helping a family right now uh, up in Cartersville, who last last uh, Easter, tornado come through, tree fell on the house, killed the man in the bedroom as he was sleeping. His wife laying next to him. The tree comes down and gets him. And so she's put in a very desperate, very vulnerable position. She's got a got a small girl, and so part of our work is helping them, helping them to get reestablished and bring them up out of that vulnerability. This is all, this is all the Lord at work doing this. Um, let me just read you just um, a couple of verses of Scripture. You don't have to turn there, but this is, um, let me see here. This is, um, this is telling us what our God is like, okay? And uh, maybe I can, we'll, we'll be around, and I know you may have some questions and some things to talk about, but you can... Uh, again, thank God for you guys and being involved with this and the financial contribution that you make every month, the prayers that come along with that. But, you know, you can, you can sponsor a child. You can, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can go whenever the world opens back up. You can actually travel to Thailand and see this work in person, meet these kids who have been so vulnerable but their lives have been, have been turned around. So many ways. You can volunteer right here at home to do different things in, in disaster relief and that kind of thing. But listen to what kind of God our God is. It's, this is Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 15. It says, It is a joy for the just to do justice, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number... Let's see. Verse number 7. The righteous, that's us, the righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. And then Isaiah chapter number 30 and verse number 18. And this is the last one. Isaiah 30, verse number 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of justice. He's a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. So this is, this is our God. This is who he is. And I don't know, maybe the Lord somehow has, uh, has spoken to you today. And uh, maybe it has nothing to do with Thailand. Maybe it has... Maybe it's something personal with you. God has spoke to you because one thing I, I've learned through the years as I've done this, I've been in churches and shared a little bit of our story and all of this, is that God is always at work. He's always at work in you. He's always at work around you. 
His, His Spirit speaks to you and He draws you. And so I don't know what the Lord may be doing in your life today, but, but what I see from my own experience, the Lord is calling us to turn our eyes out to the world, out to the poor, out to the vulnerable, out to the hungry, to the naked, the imprisoned, to just like Matthew 25 talks about. That is still the heart of God. What that looks like for you right here, I don't know. Because you know what? The Christian life is simply about following Him. It's about following Him, listening to Him, trusting Him, living this life of faith, following Him wherever He goes, and saying yes to Him. In fact, we need to have, uh, we need to be able to say yes to Him before He ever asks the question. That's a big one. Before he ever says to you, I want you to do this. I want you to talk to him. I want you to do this. Before he even taps you on the shoulder and says, come here and do this. In our mind, in our heart, we already say, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do wherever you lead me, whatever you say. That is the life of faith. That's the life of faith. Trusting him with the consequences of wherever He calls you to go. Isn't that our life? Isn't, isn't that the Christian life? That's what it is. However the Lord's leading you, calling you, I'm going to pray and probably have a song. And you just respond to Him any way that the Lord's calling you to do that. And then Angie and I will be around to answer any questions you may have about Thailand, the work, trafficking, anything at all. About following Jesus even. Let's pray together. Father... We do thank you so much. First of all, just for who you are. Oh my, you are the great God of the universe. You are our Savior, our Redeemer, our hope. And not, not only our hope, but the hope for all mankind. Lord, we thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. You, you went to the cross to pay for our sin, to set us free. Lord, as we come to you, Lord, we know that you loved us so much that, that God himself gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This, uh, this message needs to be sounded throughout Douglasville, Hiram, Bangkok, Patia, to the ends of the earth. Lord, use us to do that. We give ourselves to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we stand together and have a song, then uh, you respond any way the Holy Spirit's leading you to come this morning.